care. Uh, but also we believe that it will be impossible to reach the global and national UNAIDS targets of 95, 95, 95 without addressing advanced HIV disease. So we are excited to have uh, a very robust panel that's going to walk you through our lessons from Malawi. Um, but first, a few housekeeping um, uh, notes. Um, there will be interpretation available in American Sign Language, French, Portuguese, and Swahili. Uh, you can see here how to access those. It's also copied in the chat for you to uh, look at again. Um, we would like to ask you to introduce yourself in the chat so that we know who has joined us for this session. Um, and if you have any questions or comments, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. And then finally, this uh, evidence to action webinar is also recorded and will be shared. So without further ado, I would like to hand over to Dr. Apollo. Oh, no, sorry, I won't hand over yet. We, I'll walk you through the agenda um, and specifically focus on our panelists. We have Dr. Judith Coase. She is our director of pediatric and adolescent services uh, based in Nairobi for our global team, Eddie Matia, who is the project lead of Advanced HIV based in Malawi, and Vincent Tukai, the director of public health evaluations uh, based in Iswatini. Um, and then we will uh, hopefully have uh, 20 minutes left to uh, take questions and answers and have a robust discussion. But before we go there, I'll hand over to Dr. Apollo Tiam who is our Vice President of Technical Strategies and of Innovation based in Washington, DC. Apollo, over to you. Thank you very, thank you very much, Anya. And um, allow me to also join Anya to welcome everyone uh, to this important webinar. And um, I think without uh, much delay, we will just go straight into the presentation and the order of the presentation. We start with Eddie, uh, who is one of the lead presenters, and we present, uh, uh, with, uh, run us through the slides from Malawi, then that will be followed by Vincent, and then uh, Judith, our director of pediatric and adolescent, will give us some uh, uh, update around advanced HIV disease in, disease in children. And thereafter, we will uh, go ahead and have the panel uh, discussion. Um, just as a reminder, when you have questions, please, just, you can put your question in the chat box. Uh, Eddie, over to you. Thank you. Uh, can you go ahead and start the presentation? Thank you. Technical difficulty. Um, Eddie, are you able to start the presentation now? Um, double clicking on your screen.
Hello. Yes, Eddie, we can hear you now. Go ahead, please. Okay. Um, sorry, apologies for the um, technical issue. Um, so once again, I'm Eddie Matia, and I'm working with um, ECPAF here in Malawi, and I'll take you through some slides um, that we had presented at uh, IAS 2022 uh, on the work on advanced HIV uh, disease in Malawi. Mainly it was a, a quality improvement project, um, scaling up um, advanced HIV services in Malawi and offering an optimized um, AHD package. So um, the main goal of the project was to improve outcomes of the advanced HIV program by defining and scaling practical models um, of care. Um, that is for advanced HIV services for people living with HIV in Malawi. And secondly, to disseminate these models of, of care um, and best practices to countries of similar disease uh, burden. Of course, the project was um, supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates uh, Foundation and uh, operated in seven districts uh, in Malawi. And we had multiple partners, including uh, partners in um, Hope, Baylor, and Lighthouse, who were part of the project as well. So in terms of the models that were applied, we used uh, a hub and spoke model uh, for the scale up of advanced HIV services at both hub and spoke sites. So the hub sites were mainly, um, you know, um, secondary level uh, facilities that had a, a fully functional laboratory. To some extent, um, they had access to um, 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 prophylactic and preemptive um, um, treatments for opportunistic infections. They also had some clinical expertise, and more especially for this project, we had uh, uh, deployed um, AHD clinicians that were based at uh, three of the hub sites that uh, the project was supporting. And also we had um, uh, available um, liposomal amphotericin B for the management of confirmed cryptococcal meningitis. We had access to TB treatment and other treatments for um, other opportunistic infections. And uh, finally at the hub site, there was also support um, for the advanced HIV um, uh, clients um, that is mainly adherent support and community support um, services that uh, are available. And for the spoke sites, as you know, these are mainly health centers or primary care facilities. Um, in terms of screening and diagnosis for advanced HIV and also for um, diagnosing other opportunistic infections, we used a, a sample uh, transportation method um, to transport samples, um, that is CD4 samples um, um, to the hub site for testing on a weekly basis, um, sometimes even two or two times uh, in a week. And depending on the outcomes, um, the other samples were, the same sample uh, would be tested for um, serum crag and the urine sample would also be collected and tested for, um, uh, for, uh, for TB lamb. That is if the CD4 count was less and 200. So this encouraged uh, reflex, reflex testing uh, um, for um, opportunistic infections and also um, aiming to reduce the turnaround time. And at the, at the spoke site, patients had access to um, TPT, CPT, and fluconazole. And if they were diagnosed with an opportunistic infection, um, most of the, almost all our sites were, the primary healthcare sites were TB reg registration sites, so they were offering um, um, TB treatment and follow up for the patients. For cryptococcal meningitis patients, they would receive the induction treatment at the, at the hub site. And once the patients had stabilized and were discharged, they continued their consolidation and maintenance uh, phases of the crypto treatment at their nearest um, uh, health center. And there was also um, adherent support services available at the spoke sites. So in terms of um, collaboration, um, for this project, we worked uh, hand in hand with the Ministry of Health. Um, that is through the Directorate of HIV AIDS and Hepatitis. And at the DHA, 
At THA, there was a focal person um, for Advanced HIV who supported the project and worked with, uh, with the team here at EGPATH and together with the Q, Q, um, QMD um, that supported the quality um, aspects of the project. That is the Quality Management Directorate. So in terms of some of the programmatic data um, that we share between January 2021 and March 2022, we observed um, high AHD screening uptake in both, uh, both the hub and spoke sites um, using both um, CD4 testing and WHO staging. For CD4 testing, uh, we observed that uh, for new HIV positive patients, 74% had access to CD4 testing. And for clients that were brought back to care, 54% um, had a CD4 test done. And generally, new HIV positive patients observed to about 29% observed to have advanced HIV. And those that were brought back to care, about 22% uh, had um, advanced HIV. However, observed a high proportion of deaths, um, that is within six months of enrollment into AHT care. Uh, as you know, this could be possibly due to iris and also um, um, late presentation of, of the patients. However, the mortality was higher in unstable uh, AHT patients that were admitted. In terms of retention, we had good retention in the program of 90%. However, due to logistical issues, um, those suboptimal viral load uptake and TB and cryptococcal infection screening were optimal in both hub and spoke sites. In terms of the QI implementation, we used uh, this roadmap. So basically we trained health workers, we followed them up and mentored them in their facilities. And every quarter we had um, learning sessions uh, uh, with the QI teams in the facilities to learn best practices. So this is one of the slides just showing you um, a quality improvement project on um, advanced HIV screening using CD4 testing. Um, the main barrier to CD4 testing was the availability of CD4 cartridges um, from the Ministry of Health. That is the er erratic supply affected um, CD4 um, testing. In terms of lessons learned, um, in terms of health system strengthening, um, we observed that um, HD screening was scaled up um, mostly in sites that had decentralized the testing, the CD4 testing, to the ART clinic from the labs. And uh, also um, spoke sites were able to, uh, we had introduced TBLAM and CRAG kits to spoke sites so that they could do the testing on their own. And at the coming in of VC Tech, uh, we also saw an improvement in both. And it's also important for um, there to be capacity building sessions, practical sessions for uh, both uh, health workers, I mean, nurses and clinicians. And we had a, a robust MND system. So um, due to time, I'll just go into um, the evaluation of, of the project. Um, I'll just present in short uh, uh, quantitative and qualitative um, data from the from the evaluation that is currently ongoing. So the main aim of the evaluation was to assess the introduction of the optimized DHT package, that is including the hub and spoke model and also the use of QI to support the scale up of DHT um, services. And the main objectives were to, to determine the effect of implementing an optimized DHT package and also to assess the acceptability and feasibility um, of the um, optimized HD package. Our evaluation in terms of methodology was mainly a non-randomized control cluster study comparing the intervention and um, intervention in the intervention sites and control sites. And also we had a qualitative component where we evaluated the acceptability and feasibility. Um, the study, uh, in terms of study sites, were 22 intervention sites and 13 uh, control sites. And we mostly, in terms of study population, were or PLHIV uh, who were um, diagnosed with HD as per WHO guidelines. And the primary endpoint of our evaluation was to assess the risk of death um, 
for clients who were enrolled into AHD care and support. So in terms of the enrollments, um, as of the time this presentation was made, we had enrolled 805 uh, uh, participants and 60% were from the intervention sites and 40 from the control sites. Uh, those equal distribution of, of um, according to gender, based on gender, and the median age was, was 37. Um, for children, uh, um, 33 children were enrolled. Um, that is those who were under five in the study, representing 4.9%. Overall, the majority of patients were, that were enrolled were newly diagnosed, uh, HIV uh, positive patients at 63, followed by those who had um, who were ART experienced. The median CD4 count was uh, 122 with an IQR of 73 to uh, 172. Overall, in terms of the TB screening and diagnosis, uh, more clients was, were uh, screened for TB, um, signs and symptoms in intervention sites compared to the HAP sites. Uh, in terms of identification of TB, uh, um, positive patients, uh, there was no difference between the, the, the intervention and control. And the methodology that was used mostly of TB um, um, screening and diagnosis was um, TB LAM, with more LAM tests being done in the, in the intervention sites. And in terms of positivity, there was a higher positivity observed in the intervention sites compared to the control sites. We saw a similar trend with other opportunistic infections such as crypto and Kaposi sarcoma. We had more uh, cases uh, diagnosed in the intervention sites where there was optimized HD screening. In conclusion, we observed an increased diagnosis of TB, crypto and Kaposi sarcoma in the intervention sites compared to the control sites, which could be linked to the enhanced screening that took place. TB LAM positivity rate was higher in the intervention sites and the main cause was quite unclear. However, uh, we do um, recommend that there should be a parallel access to TB LAM expert testing and chest X-ray to improve the certainty of a TB diagnosis. In terms of um, acceptability of the model, um, the models were well accepted by the health workers and we feel that there was positive, um, positive health systems. There was a positive health system impact using the QI based approach, even, even though the cost of implementing the QI approach um, is, is quite high, it's relatively high. Thank you very much and over. No, thank you very much, uh, Eddie. And uh, we will just, uh, I think we, because of time, we will just uh, continue with the presentations um, and then we'll now move to Vincent, um, you know, because our AHD work started actually in Lesotho. So the data Vincent will be presenting from Lesotho. Uh, over to you, Vincent. We'll, we are taking note of all the questions and we'll answer at the end. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Um, a little bit of a challenge with putting my slides on uh, slideshow. Wow. But in the interest of time, I'll get started. So uh, I'm going to be uh, talking about a study that we carried out in Lesotho titled Implementation and Evaluation of Differentiated HIV Care and Treatment for People with Advanced HIV Disease. What we basically did, this was a CDC funded study uh, conducted by the Ministry of Health and ECPAF was the implementing partner. The aim was to strengthen and assess health service delivery for people living with HIV who had advanced HIV disease uh, by introducing a package of care that we gave them and then we'll be able to record specific uh, outcomes. We abstracted data from the records for our analysis. 
We did this in two district hospitals in Leribe and Berea districts, specifically Motebang Hospital in Leribe and uh, Berea Government Hospital. Uh, we, the study focused on participants who were 15 years or older, who were either entering into care or re-entering care uh, and had advanced HIV disease. And this study was conducted in end of 2018 to end of 2019, to December 2019. Uh, the plan or the idea in which the study followed was that we would enroll participants, get them on ART and follow them for a period of six months and then capture that data. The objectives were focused on key process outcomes and uh, I mean, process and uh, selected patient outcomes. And all these were focused on uh, the package of care as defined by WHO and the Ministry of Health guidelines. So quickly, I will just go through some of the components in the processes for management of patients with advanced uh, HIV disease that we looked at. One was a same day CD4 cell count testing and WHO staging. We wanted to understand or to uh, assess the proportion of patients that would have that same day uh, assessment. Same day, also rapid initiation of ART within seven days, we wanted to establish and know the proportion. Uh, same day serum crag, this is testing for cryptococcal antigen, especially for patients whose CD4 were less than 100. Uh, and then TB screening at every clinical visit, uh, followed by prompt initiation of TB tre treatment within three days of TB diagnosis for those who are co-infected. Uh, the other th things that we looked at were prompt initiation of TB preventive therapy within three days of a negative TB symptom screen for uh, all these patients. Uh, we also looked at, we wanted to understand the proportion that would have same day initiation of cotrimoxazole on the day of enrollment and then a documented clinical exam at every visit. And lastly, we wanted, uh, as part of the process for management of these patients, there would be intensive follow-up and we were to document the proportion that would have intensive follow-up, which included weekly phone calls for the first four weeks after enrollment and active tracking of missed uh, appointments. The other key patient outcomes that we looked at were survival at three and six months uh, of follow-up or of ART, retention also at the same time points, adherence to ART and viral suppression uh, at six months of ART. So here are the, what we observed or what came out of our evaluation. Uh, the table here shows the characteristics of the patients that we screened over that time period. Altogether, we had 537 patients uh, and about 23.4% of them were in stage three, stage four disease. We were unable to do CD4 counts on all of them, but the proportion that got a CD4 count were about 150, which is like about one quarter, slightly over a quarter of the patients that we screened were able to get a CD4 count. And out of those that we did a CD4 count, 46%, close to 47% actually had CD4 counts less than 200. We had challenges with CD4, uh, getting CD4s done. That, that, that's why you're seeing the numbers low there. Then we also screened for danger signs uh, that we had a list of danger signs based on WHO staging. I'm sorry, uh, I was unable to put this uh, on, on, a, on a presentation mode. So this may be small from your end, but it just shows what I've just been explaining that we did screen 537 people and we ended up with uh, uh, 149 of the 537 had advanced HIV disease. So this 149 represented about 28% or 27.7% to be exact of all the patients who were entering or re-entering care, they came back with advanced HIV disease. 
For our study, we were able through additional criteria, we had 109 patients from the two hospitals. Uh, most of them, uh, the Venn diagram you see on the right represents uh, the distribution immunologic and clinical status of these patients when they came. 70 of them had uh, uh, CD4 less than 200 and the other ones were able to pick them with WHO. The 79 uh, represents those that were picked based on WHO staging alone. And most of these patients were actually staged. They did not get an opportunity to do a CD4, the 79. That's why they happen to be on that side of the Venn diagram. Um, the results in regard to timing of service provision for these patients, remember one of the process objectives we wanted to know is how quickly they get initiated on ART. Uh, we were able to document that quite a number a, a, a over, I mean, a, a larger proportion were initiated ART within the seven day period from the time they returned into care or they entered into care. However, we do acknowledge that there was still about close to 23% of patients who delayed initiating ART beyond the seven day period. TB screening was excellent. Everybody got screened for TB uh, uh, in a timely manner. However, uh, the initiation of prophylaxis, TPT initiation was a little bit delayed for some people. To be honest, we had like after uh, more, more than half the patients were either not initiated or had their uh, TB preventive therapy initiated after three days. Now, obviously, uh, some of the patients were not initiated because they were already on active TB treatment, but there were quite a number of hurdles that we faced during that time that could not allow us to get everybody on TB preventive therapy. That is everyone who was eligible. Uh, we did have uh, gene expert services and we were able to at least screen patients. Uh, quite a number of them got the screening initially. Those that were symptomatic and needed uh, gene expert screening. Uh, just to report on Cotrim oxys or Cotrim prophylaxis, we, there was not a big challenge. The majority of patients, all but one, uh, were not initiated on uh, uh, Cotrim. And uh, the, that one, really the reasons were that the patient disappeared so fast, so could not be initiated. But serum crag, there was a challenge on serum crag screening for patients who were eligible. That is those who had a CD4 of less or equal to 100 or were stage three or four based on the guidelines. We had 97 of them and uh, more than half of them did not get a serum crag done. I will share a little bit more about the serum crag in a, a slide or two. Uh, then the other thing that we did was the follow-up of patients the active follow-up that happened uh, the weeks after initiating ART. As shown in this table, uh, most of our patients either, I mean, did come back for their appointments. If you can see, I think column four that uh, is labeled number seen at the facility, uh, the proportions moved from 86% uh, two weeks later up to about 69% by 24 weeks of follow-up. Uh, the losses were mainly because some patients died before they could come back for their appointments, as you can see in the next column, and then others just missed appointments, despite the intensive follow-up that we applied. TB treatment outcomes at six months, we had uh, about 50% of patients had either completed or were cured, based on the definitions given by WHO for TB treatment. Uh, we did have some patients who were still on treatment up to about 17%. But what is notable on this table is that 23.5% uh, of the 34 patients that we had on TB treatment actually died. Now, this was quite a, a, a high proportion that we witnessed. Then uh, this is the slide I referred to earlier of cryptococcal screening. This is the cascade. We started with 97 patients who were eligible out of all the cohort that we had. And uh, 45 of them managed, we got a serum crack. Again, here we had challenges with getting everybody's getting a serum crack, but the 45, five of them turned positive. And those five, four of them got a CSF crack and actually the, all the CSF cracks came positive and we treated them. In the end, we treated all five patients because for the one remainder, uh, 
uh, the, the other patient that was not given a CSF crack, uh, the clinician uh, by his own judgment did go ahead and treat the patient uh, based on some of the symptoms that they were seeing in the patient. Um, then final outcomes at the end of the six month follow-up for the entire cohort of patients. Just in this table, the key things I want to point out is that only 76 of 109 patients, that is about 70%, did reach the six-month follow-up. Uh, we lost 11 patients. That was about 10%. And remember, out of this 11, eight of them were contributed by TB. So TB was a, a big contributor to mortality in this. At least the final diagnosis before death was TB for eight out of the 11. Then also loss to follow up was at 15.6%. And then uh, viral suppression was 85.1%. That is for, for this group of patients that we managed to follow. Now, these were the main final outcomes of our small cohort of patients that we had in Lesotho. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, 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 Dr. Vincent, and, uh, and I think we'll just move on um, and please continue to send your questions uh, in the chat room, in the Q&A, um, uh, using the Q&A tab uh, and, um, as we move to Judith. Judith, over to you to talk about children and adolescents. Thank you, Akolo. Thank you, everyone, and welcome. As we go towards the end of this panel, I'm going to take a few minutes just to highlight the WHO package of care for children and adolescents with advanced HIV disease, basically to sensitize the participants and also talk about certain key things that we should consider. I will not talk about the data, and I know uh, Nicole, you already asked a question about pediatric and adolescent AHD data for Malawi, and maybe uh, Eddie and the Malawi team will respond after this. But I really want to just highlight what we have out there and what people should be focusing on to sensitize. So I'm going to focus more on that on my presentation. But just as a start, we know, and this is based on the UN, recent UNAIDS data, we know that there's still a gap in terms of children living with HIV not on treatment. Only 52 to 54% of children are on treatment. And among the rest who are not on treatment, almost two thirds of them are aged five years or older. So the slide you see on the left highlights the proportion of children not on treatment. And the slide on the, on the right shows the global death. So basically, while there's been a reduction in the global deaths among children and adolescents living with HIV, the deaths still remain and we are still really off target. I mean, you think about those who are missing treatment and those who are dying, a lot of this is because of advanced HIV disease. And data has shown that 30% of children and adolescents still present with severe immunosuppression and indeed advanced HIV disease. And so this is something that we must address keenly, especially in this realm. So this other slide really focuses on what was published by Nathan Ford et al. And this was published in the Lancet in 2016. And it was looking at the causes of morbidity and mortality among people living with HIV, both adults and children. And I will focus on the children right from the middle of the slide. And TB and severe bacterial infections still remain a major cause of mortality among children living with HIV. And so these are things that must be screened, must be treated for and prevented for us to reduce the mortality when it comes to children and adolescents living with HIV. Now, going on to the definition of pediatric and adolescent advanced HIV, and this is from the technical brief that was produced by WHO. So it, it defines children more than five years as having advanced HIV disease if they are of WHO stage three or four, or a CD4 count less than 200 cells per millimeters cubed. And so this means that even as we implement our HIV programs, we need to ensure that there's WHO staging with documentation and or CD4 test that is available for all who are, who are enrolled. For children who are less than five, the definition has since been revised. And so while all children less than five years are considered to who have advanced HIV disease, those who have been on treatment for more than a year and are clinically stable are considered not to have advanced HIV disease and so are eligible for other models of, of, of testing. And so this requires keen monitoring of children who are enrolled on treatment to identify who has advanced HIV disease, who is no longer part of that cohort so that they can get the relevant support 
including multi-month dispensation for those who are stable among the children. So one of the ways that the WHO document has framed the, the package of care for children and adolescents with advanced HIV disease is through the STOP AIDS framework. And so this is a, a framework that looks at screening for TB, crypto, and developmental delay. The T is for treating TB, crypto, and other, other infections. O is for optimizing and getting early ART, as well as P to prevent TB, pneumocystis carinae, crypto, and other diseases. And I shall be focusing on the next slide on the key messages that you should be focusing on. So really, the frame is to have the stop aids in terms of uh, addressing pediatric and adolescents uh, advanced HIV disease. So when you think about the stop aids, the four sections, and these are the key messages when it comes to addressing the pediatric advanced HIV disease. So for screening, it is critical to ensure that there's proper screening and diagnostics for children with advanced HIV disease, screening for TB, both for molecular testing, but also using other samples like urine, and the LF LAM has been proved as a key diagnostic tool for TB. So as we know, sampling for TB in children has been a challenge, but now we have an opportunity to use other samples like urine, like stool, and other samples that can be used. So it's important to ensure that this is done to identify children with advanced HIV disease. When it comes to the T, which is a treatment, there needs to be treatment of TB and other OIs as, as, as required. And for the treatment of TB, the dose remains the same as other children, as other, other children with TB, but the ARV dosage must be adjusted. So for the children who are put on a DTG treatment, the DTG dose should be adjusted so that you get the same DTG dose, but in double dose. And if they're still on LPVR uh, formulation, then the, they should be super boosted with ritonavir. There's need to ensure ident identification and treatment of the severe bacterial infections. Remember from the study that I highlighted, this is a major cause of mortality among children. There's also need to screen and treat for malnutrition, which indeed is a main driver of mortality as shown in many other studies as well, as well as starting ART as soon as possible. And when you talk about malnutrition, they should have you know, th therapeutic feeding just like other, other children with malnutrition, but also include high dose vitamin A and zinc and other, other, other formulations as required. When it comes to the O, there's need to optimize treatment for children, enable rapid ART initiation with appropriate counseling and support. And this counseling and support should include caregivers as well. Ensure that the, those with comorbidities are stabilized before ART is started. And, and during ART initiation, ensure that there's, you know, there's follow-up of those who are lost to follow up, lost to lost to care when they are brought up. There's initiation of ART as well as you know a, a screening for advanced HIV disease, and to ensure that there's linkage to facility providing routine care. A lot of children who are diagnosed with advanced HIV disease will be diagnosed in an inpatient setting, so there's need to ensure that there's follow-up for routine care after discharge. And indeed, there's the need for the prevent part, which is prevention using cotrimoxazole, vaccines, fluconazole for adolescents with drug positives and other vaccinations as required. So this really summarizes the key messages under the STOP AIDS uh, framework for children. I want to now use the next couple of slides to highlight the implementation considerations for pediatric advanced HIV disease. And this is based one on the technical brief from WHO, but also from our experiences at EGPAF, because now we are scaling up our pediatric advanced HIV services in a number of our countries. So at national level, there's need to critically harmonize and align the various recommendations adopted by countries. So be it for HIV treatment, for TB, or even care for bacterial infections, these need to be harmonized because we have the same patient with advanced HIV disease that need the care. So there's need to be harmonization for these, as well as harmonization in terms of registration and procurement of commodities. Be there commodities for diagnostics or for treatment that needs to be harmonized as well as issues around translating policies and guidelines. Indeed, we find that in countries, the policies and guidelines are there. The issue is translating these into practice. At facility level, like Eddie mentioned in the Malawi example, we need to implement the hub and spoke model so that you have a site that is supporting other sites and building it out. It's, a, it's important to enable and to support task shifting for some of the components around the advanced HIV disease. 
ensure a right mix of commodities for screening tools and having a child-friendly environment in facilities, supporting the bi-directional referrals from the hub and the spokes to ensure that children are able to be referred effectively based on the needs and also have a structure flow in facilities so that they can navigate from outpatient where maybe screening will be done through inpatient, maybe maybe they're in, in admitted for treatment, and also to be to able to manage the the, the appointment uh, management effectively. In terms of commodities, I've already highlighted this. So commodities covers the lab, the pharmaceuticals, and the non-pharmaceuticals, ensuring we have proper procedures on how to manage these commodities in all at all levels. Ensure the staffing for the lab to ensure that they are able to collect samples, to network the samples, and also address the other pharmaceutical and non-pharmaceutical needs at all levels. The healthcare providers, there's need to build capacity to train them and to motivate them to continue implementing the services, but also use a multidisciplinary team approach to manage patients with adverse HIV disease so that the whole team is addressing the various needs of the patient. There's need to improve patient monitoring, not just in terms of data with disaggregated data, but also ensure that we're doing drug toxicity monitoring and reporting. We're able to implement longitudinal follow-up for each of the cases that we are managing because remember they need a number of services, but also to have routine mortality audits. I already alluded to the routine m &E evaluation, but also ensure that our approach is patient-centered, having caregiver literacy, involvement in the care, involving the adolescents in their care and peer support for the adolescents and their adherents, looking at other models of care, such as flexi hours, child adolescent friendly clinics and corners, but also ensuring we implement community-based support and interventions to complement our clinical interventions. So th these are key implementation considerations that we highlight here for us to be able to implement proper pediatric advanced HIV disease. I'm going to end there, Apollo, so that we go to the questions. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Judith, and thank you um, all other uh, panelists, uh, Eddie, um, Vincent, and uh, for those who um, bandwidth and support video, you can put yourself in on video um, for the panelists. Uh, so that we can start to answer the question. I think the key thing, uh, you know, that we should remember is that if we are talking about patient-centered care, advanced HIV disease is part of care for people living with HIV. It's not a project. It is just the right thing to do. And we cannot reach the, like Anya said, the 95, 95, 95, if we do not integrate the uh, advanced HIV disease into our programming. And whether from Malawi or in uh, Lesotho, we see that uh, one in uh, four to one in uh, five among our patients who are presenting in the clinic have advanced HIV disease. That's 20 to 25%. And that no number goes up to 40% in certain countries in Central and West Africa. And of note is that 60% of those patients who are with advanced HIV disease are patients who are newly diagnosed, but 40% are actually patients who were in care and uh, disengaged from care and are returning to care. So, and TB remains the leading cause of death with critical uh, uh, infection uh, uh, coming behind and cancers such as uh, Kaposi sarcoma and, um, uh, and cervical cancer. Children have advanced HIV disease. I think that is a key. And really I am implementing the STOP strategy is something that we should all do to save many children out there who are suffering from advanced HIV disease. Simple interventions such as TB lamp can actually save life in terms of picking patients who have a TB early. So there are a number of questions uh, uh, already in the chat room and thanks to Eddie and um, uh, other uh, and uh, Vincent, a number of questions have been uh, re uh, answered already. So um, I will start the question with the uh, with um, uh, the question from Juma. You know, who we'll said thanks uh, for the presentation, Malai. What's the proportion of AHD uh, client identified through uh, whether WHO stage and CD4? And um, I think uh, uh, Eddie has responded to that question. And uh, 
And can you talk more about a CD4 referral from spoke to hub? Have, have you introduced VC Tech? If yes, uh, could you share your experience? Eddie, I think this is something that you are well aware. So maybe you just unmute yourself and share with the group uh, you know, your experience there. Thanks. Well, thank you, Dr. Polo. Um, so um, for, in terms of um, the proportions that had CD4 alone um, in, in, our, in, in our program we had 74% that had CD4 alone um, for diagnosing AHD, but staging, um, that was staged for about, um, that were found to have AHD by WHO staging was quite low, at about 26%. Um, for the referrals, um, so we, um, we had a sample courier, another uh, implementing partner that already uh, transports samples between spokes and hubs, mainly um, viral load samples and sputum samples to the hub site. So we just um, we just tagged along our CD4 samples to those riders and um, they they followed, they, they went to the facilities a bit more, uh, at least twice a week or three times a week, um, but mainly uh, using a USSD system. So the, the spoke sites would have uh, a number, they'll dial a number on their phone and the rider would come to pick a sample when it's available. Um, so it was more of a pool system. And for the use of uh, VC Tech, yes, we uh, deployed VC Tech in our sites um, since February this year. Um, this was, um, I think it came at the right time when we were having a stock out of CD4 cartridges. And these were mainly intended for the uh, primary healthcare sites, so the health centers. Our experience so far is we're having um, a higher AHT prevalence with, um, with VC Tech. Um, of course, there are other issues. Um, I mean, higher prevalence compared to the PIMA um, um, machines. So um, there's an issue of it being a subjective test uh, and um, something that we, are, we continue to uh, look into and uh, also follow up mentorship for the teams that we, we had trained. But um, however, so far, uh, so good. Over. No, thank you very much, uh, uh, Eddie. And um, one easy question from Nicholas um, Agatis, um, whether we are going to repeat the study in uh, Lesotho. Yes, and uh, Nicola, I think we, I can confirm to you that we will be repeating the study in Lesotho starting January, 2023. Uh, you know, especially looking at Lesotho, uh, for those who may not be aware, Lesotho has rich epidemic control. So we want to see what would be the contribution of advanced HIV disease, uh, you know, in a country that has rich epidemic control and using the initial data, um, you know, to compare the progress there. So there's a question from Rebecca uh, Belly that says, why were, so, were there so many, um, uh, so few patients with positive serum crack uh, te uh, tested for CSF crack? Was the CSF crack only done for patients with signs and symptoms of cryptochrome meningitis? Um, I guess that question goes to Eddie. You know, Eddie, do you want to take that question? Um, thank you, Paulo. Um, so for um, so for for our for our um, um, program, we actually had 90% um, uh, of our clients that um, had um, that were eligible for serum crack have a, um, a serum crack done, and it was based on um, having a CD4 less than 200 or a WHO stage 3 uh, or 4. Over. Yes. Great. So, so basically, the number was not few. And if you are talking about Lesotho number, um, uh, Rebecca, there was one site in Lesotho that had challenges with supply of uh, uh, tests, you know, that had stuck out at some point and needed additional support to uh, roll out, um, um, uh, you know, the cryptococcal uh, 
testing. Also, there was challenge about uh, availability of people who had skills to actually provide, uh, you know, the, the lumbar puncture, and that took some time to get established because this was the first place where we were starting advanced HIV disease. So, and uh, from anonymous, a wonderful presentation. But John, wondering if the cutoff of fifteen years. Um, you know, impacted on the number and the age of people who had um, advanced HIV disease. And I think this is to uh, uh, Vincent. I think this question is not surprising to us. <laughs> uh, uh, go ahead, uh, uh, Vincent. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, he's right, or he or she is right. Uh, uh, we, we definitely expect, even based on the definition of advanced HIV disease for, for, for children, we definitely would have got more numbers if we had taken uh, all ages. So this, uh, what you're raising is true. Even among adults, the numbers that we report, we have a feeling that this was underreporting because there, there were times that we did not have a, a CD4 machines in operation uh, because of various reasons. And during that time, we only relied on uh, staging, uh, which you are very familiar that sometimes you can have a person stage one and yet the CD4 is only 50 or something like that. So thank you for the comment. No, no thank you very much. And, um, and um, we have five minutes and I'm trying to see how we can pick as many questions as we can um, and please keep on sending them. And I see a question, um, you know, Rebecca Bailey just said the question was for uh, Vincent um, about the number of patients, the difference between the num uh, patients who had uh, uh, okay. and um, uh, we were able to do so, CRAS CSF. Just quickly saying, uh, so we, we, we had 97 patients eligible we did serum crack on 45 of them. So that's where the problem was. But um, uh, out of the 45, five of them had a positive serum crack and four of the five got a CSF crack. So CSF cracks were done on four out of five. But the problem was getting the serum cracks done. And that was because of a problem of uh, the kits being out of stock as Apollo had already mentioned earlier. Uh, for a long time, we struggled with this. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you very much, Evans. And, and, and I think for every country, if you want to really introduce uh, advanced HIV disease, uh, serum crack is a very simple test, straightforward, it's cost effective. And um, a lot of times people mystify it, but I would say, just go ahead and procure it. It saves lives, I can say that at least with the learning curve in Lesotho and now the full implementation in Malawi, it saves lives, uh, you know, it's something great. So there's a question from Maya White here. Um, uh, so um, uh, she was mentioning about diagnosing children still being a challenge uh, for uh, those who are less than he, uh, five years. And she's bringing the evidence around um, hemoglobin less than 10 gram uh, in children on uh, ART being a predictor of a TB. And I'm um, asking whether we have uh, that consideration in our program. Um, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, thanks, Mayo, for the question. Actually, what you raised was discussed in the WHO technical team that was discussing the, the, the stop TB and the pediatric advanced HIV disease uh, consideration. So this, this did not make it to the final you know, criteria. And the reason is because, one, for a child to have low HB, especially in the African setting, there'll be many other reasons that may cause HB. So maybe it can be a predictor for TB, but not as much. But the other consolation was from the meeting is that when a child has low HB, this is a child who, one, is likely to be sick, so will be admitted and hence can be screened for adverse HIV disease. They are likely to be malnourished, so they can be picked in the malnutrition cycle. So if we are if we are screening children very well in the various service entry points, then this child with low HB who maybe has TB is likely to be picked. So that is the reasoning behind it. And I agree with you, that can be considered a predictor, but the, the, the evidence was not as strong as, as was expected. Thanks for that question. No, thank you very, very much, Judith. And I will just uh, appeal to our team, um, Tulani, who is likely to be on the call and is listening to me, that maybe we will review our own data out of Malawi 
you know, around, because I think we are doing routine HB, you know, among the children who were diagnosed here and the new studies that we are putting in place. Maybe this is something that we can see whether we can generate additional evidence around here, especially separating that for, uh, children with low HB from children, um, you know, looking at TB versus malaria and all that. So um, I know there are many researchers listening now and they can pick that up. So with the remaining one minute, uh, you know, I just wanted to give opportunity uh, maybe to uh, 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 Vincent particularly, Vincent, sorry to put you on the spot here. We start, all started with your uh, pro, uh, program in Lesotho, you know, to see whether you have a one closing word for the team. I think the, the, the closing word is that uh, advanced HIV disease continues to be a problem despite the maturity of our HIV programs. It's a problem both in children and adults, uh, but it's a manageable problem. It's a problem that we have clear guidelines from WHO on what to do, but there are supply chain logistical challenges to do with lab and pharmacy commodities that need to be overcome to have a successful program. We can save the, the, the hundreds, if not thousands of people who are entering or returning to care with this condition. Thank you. So thank you everyone for, you know, for attending this important webinar and see you soon on uh, uh, our next E2A. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Bye.